What would be the main reason why you'd want to move to Australia? Are you searching for a better work-life balance? Are you fed up of having to work away all the time? Do you still have that constant feeling of always needing to have a holiday booked just to escape the reality of where you live? Well, for our guest today, Jenny, that was it. Even having a good life in the UK, sometimes you just have to take your kids out of school and move thousands of miles to the other side of the world just to search for that something different. But what if you're close to your family? What if you lose elderly loved ones? Is it really just that easy to hop on a flight for 24 hours and go back? I guess we're going to find out. G'day, Jenny. How are you going? Yeah, good, thank you. How are you? Very good. It's very good. How has... It's just gone back to kind of school. You've got kids? Thank the Lord. Yeah, yeah. I was definitely ready for it. I miss those half-term weeks of the UK. We don't get those here. It's all two weeks or longer. Yeah. But I was ready for back to school for sure. Sometimes when you think to yourself, the two weeks is, is oh, is that is that a bit too long enough? Yeah. And then the fact that you then have to wait 10 weeks to get <laughs> to a break. Like sometimes you think, I don't mind a little bit of kids time, but yeah. is it too long? Yeah. Now, Jenny, can you paint a picture of your life? What was it like before you moved to Australia? Kind of what were you leaving behind? What were you hoping to find maybe? Yeah, so... Um, our life in the UK was really good. I can't lie. We were, we had a really lovely home. I had lovely friends, family around me. Um, my kids loved school. You know, we did have a good life, but my husband worked away because of where we lived. We lived southwest in the country and my husband had to work away Monday to Friday to do the job that he was doing. So for us, that was kind of the biggest issue. And at that time, our children were really, really young. So I was a bit resentful of him for not being there and doing everything myself. But also, he obviously missed out on quite big parts of the kids being young. So that was kind of the only negative to our life, really, in, in the UK, to be honest. What does he do or, or did he do? Does he do the same thing in Australia now? Yeah, so he was, when we met, he was in the Navy. So he did, yeah, quite a few years in the Navy. And then when he left, he went on to work on the trains, which is quite common, especially for like aircraft engineers. So he was a helicopter, did something with helicopters. <laughs> Who knows? I don't know. Um, and so he went on to work on trains. So yes, he does the same job here that he did in the UK. But in Somerset, we did obviously have trains, but all the big depots were in the bigger cities like Southampton. So that's where he worked or Bristol. But yeah, just where he worked, the job that was available was in Southampton at the time. Okay. So you had a pretty good life. It was just mainly the job and perhaps the work-life balance. Were there any other tipping points that made you think, you know, you want to move to Australia? Because there's lots of other places that you or other things that you could have done. Like you could have even yeah. just moved to Southampton, wouldn't that? Be yeah, crazy? I know. No, and that's and that is what I always think whenever I say that people are like you didn't need to move to the other side of the world to like have him home every night I think the the main tipping point and it sounds you know a bit bit boring a bit of the go-to answer but it was during covid like it did make me realize you know what what is life like we had a good life but what do we do at the weekend like the weather is always crap and we can't go and enjoy the nice countryside and the lovely place that we live because we did live in a great place right like it was beautiful um but we just couldn't enjoy it and so again it sounds like one of those kind of textbook answers but for me it was the weather like not necessarily the heat but just you know in the UK it is gray and miserable nine days out of ten Whereas here, like 99 days out of 100, it's blue skies, especially in Queensland and especially in the winter. I love the winter here. Like it's not boiling, you're not sweating, but who doesn't want to wake up and open their curtains and see blue sky every day, you know? Like it's, it really just changes your mood and just makes you a happier person, I think. Yeah, now one of the things that I noticed quite quickly after the whole year cycle is I thought to myself, I'm not really getting this seasonal depressed feeling. Yeah, um, absolutely. Especially this time of year. Like everyone, I was never really a Halloween person. I just no. kind of thought, I'm not really into it. But yeah. so many people would get into the Halloween spirit and want to dress up and stuff. But for me, Halloween and this time of year just signaled I'm going home yeah. in the dark and I'm yeah. going to work in the dark. And yeah. I'm going to probably do this for the 
the next six months. Yeah, yeah. And and you never pack your coat away. Like if you live in the UK, your coat never leaves. My coat here comes out maybe for two months of the year. And that's because I get on the train quite early to go into the city for work. Um, and again, it's not so much the temperature. It's just, yeah, it's just not being gloomy and raining and drizzling all the time. Like I just, I was, I was very much a seasonal depression kind of person in the UK. And as you said, I would forever have to have a holiday booked. Were you one of these people? And I've, a lot of people have mentioned this that have been on this podcast. Were you the type of person that lived for the holiday coming up? Got a hundred percent. I had to have something to look forward to when we lived in the UK, like whether that was a girl's weekend or like a family holiday or something, I had to have something to get me through, especially through winter. But because they don't like in the UK, they don't really get a summer either. You know, I speak to my friend, like I, we voice note every day and we do weather updates. Like it's the first thing we do in our voice note. And she's like, the weather is so awful. It's raining. I'm doing school run at seven degrees and it's September. And I'm just like, sorry, mate, but it's absolutely lush here. Like it's so good. I just, yeah, had to have like something booked where I knew I was going to be in the warm and I knew I was going to have sunshine. So yeah, Isn't that was that a very good. British thing anyway to just talk about the weather. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm like, I need my little bit of a fix, but still, because whenever I talk about it, like at work or something, I'm a medical receptionist. I'll always talk about the weather and people look at me like, you're a bit strange. Why are you talking about the weather so much? I'm, like, I'm English. That's what we do. That's what we do. It's Queensland. It's either yeah. hot or hotter. Like it's the same every day. <laughs> every now and again, it rains probably a little bit more over yeah. Christmas but yeah, yeah. that's just the way it is yeah I'm assuming then that your husband was your kind of main visa applicant what was your kind of yeah. visa migration how, how did that all work for you yeah so we were really lucky actually we went through an agent and basically when we applied for the visa the only visa or not available like available was a temporary visa a 491 so the agent said, you can wait to see if a permanent visa comes up, but you know, this is all they're offering because it was during COVID. Yeah. So we were like, no, like, let's just go for it. We want to just get over there and stuff. Anyway, they came back and offered us a 190. So we put in for a 491 and they offered us a 190, which our agent was like, it's pretty much unheard of. Like that never happens. We weren't the only family that happened to. I think there was three or four families um, and every single family who it happened to, their partner was ex-military or worked for the military. Like maybe not an a not actively in the military, but worked for that, that same kind of thing. Um, so we were super lucky. The whole process did take time, a lot of time. We were waiting for our visa for 13 months from when we put it in to when we got it granted, it was 13 months. Yeah, savage. I'm trying to think how long was ours? We, because ours was, uh, was granted just before COVID started. Mm. We, we got ours granted in the December and then, you know, we started having this weird Chinese virus thing coming around. And I remember being at work yeah. in March. And do you remember when they had that first bus back from wherever it was in China? that they thought was ground zero and everyone in there is having to wear a mask mm. and i always remember the look on the dry poor driver's face yeah. that had yeah. no ppe and he's like oh my god driving yeah. them to the detention center like they were a buyer little did he know little did he know what was no. to come yeah, yeah. but we're, so it, if ours was in the december and it wasn't really affected by covid i think ours must have taken about 13 months as well 12 to 13 months to be granted because we put in after our expression of interest which was either the october or the November the year before. Mm, and then yeah. ours was extended because Sam was pregnant with Aurora. So we, we got asked for our medicals and everything, but we couldn't do them because you can't have an x-ray whilst you're, you're pregnant. Yeah. So ours was artificially 13 months. So yeah. Yeah, I guess COVID did have a, it was slowing everything down really, wasn't it? Yeah. So we, we just talking about the medicals. So we had been waiting and I uh, got to a point where we'd sold our house and we were going to plan to go traveling around Europe in our motorhome home and um got to the day before we had our medicals booked and our um agent was like you'll never guess what like they've asked for your medicals and we were like oh my god they're literally booked for the next day like that's so weird so we, we did all our medicals and everything and the lady i remember she said oh you probably won't hear from us like everything will just go through and then it'll go through to the the government and they'll sort that out and then i woke up to a voicemail no i woke up to an email from them saying something's come back on your chest x-ray you need to come back in urgently um 
And I just remember this feeling because we'd sold our house, we'd sold our cars, and our children had left school, like everything was packed. Stuff had gone, literally was traveling to Australia on a shipping container. And I remember just sobbing and I was just like, oh my God, I've like ruined our life because something's going to be wrong with me. And there was like a shadowing on my lung and they, they were really concerned. Anyway, they did more x-rays and it came back and they said like it was probably just um, previous scarring from like a chest infection or something like that. But there was a good 24 hours where mm. I thought, what have I done? You know, you take that leap of faith and you think I'm going to put in this visa and everything's just going to work out and I'm going to move to the other side of the world. Not thinking that things can go wrong. Mm. Like, and that was a huge wake up call for me that it's not always plain sailing for everybody. And, you know, yeah. things can. And you ideally don't want anything wrong with you as well. Yeah. I know that they're Absolutely. Uh, I know that they're big on the chest x-rays for tuberculosis, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. You kind of think to yourself, I had the, the injection when I was a teenager. Like people were punching me in the arm for a month. Yeah. Like, I'm pretty sure I don't have tuberculosis. It's, yeah. It's one of the good inoculation uh, programs the UK seems to have. So what was it like then going through that waiting game and, oh my God, not really knowing whether you were going to get to Australia, that mm. as a hurdle. What was it like then when you finally got got here how did you feel yeah felt really good like it was very exciting we did do the eight weeks traveling around europe in the motorhome which was the best decision ever mm. when my husband suggested it i thought i can't think of anything worse than being in a can with wheels with my husband and my two kids solidly for eight weeks like how am i going to get through this but it was the best two months of my life without a doubt That's and i like would a big dream as well of uh, many australians to go and want to do that so the fact that you've you've kind of got that out of your system you oh, I don't need to do Europe now for a few years and that's the thing like we looked at it and we were like right if we're gonna really do this and we're gonna move to Australia and make our life over there it's not gonna be easy to go to Italy for the weekend or they're the things that you can't do from Australia easily and so we're like right we want our kids to see and experience these different cultures and everything so I'm so glad we did that because it was a really good journey when we from there we went to Bali and very conveniently our friend decided to book their wedding right as we were transitioning over that side of the world so we went to their wedding and then arrived in Australia and it was great it was a really great feeling but it was also like oh god you know we haven't really lived in the real world for quite a while now and we've got to find a job and buy cars and be real life grown-ups again and I think after the initial excitement it was a bit like oh god I've got to do all of this and I don't know how anything works um, and I think one of the hardest things when you arrive is you've got this whole list of things you need to do but you can't do one without the other, but they won't let you do that without something else. So you almost have to really plan out, like Medicare wouldn't let you yep. claim, like um, apply for a Medicare card without having an address, but you can't get a rental without a bank card and you can't get, you can't get a bank account without an address. It's like- It's that hundred points of identity or whatever they call <laughs> it that you need to get. And it's like, I've got none of them. I've got, I I've know. got a few because I've got a foreign passport. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I, I remember standing at the school the primary school trying to enroll my kids and they're like like that whole thing 100 points and I'm like I can't give you that I don't have does that mean you're not going to take my kids to school like yeah. it's it's very regimented and they don't care like it's a bit like the visa process mm. either you, you do it or don't they're not there's no kind of oh well we'll we'll be lenient with this or whatever it's like this these are our rules and if you don't like it then that's that yeah you either have the piece of paper or the evidence that you need <laughs> or you don't and then if you don't and you kind of think well is there another way they sit and look at you about just thinking we'll go and get it yeah <laughs> told you what you need you don't have it so you need to go and get it yeah and figure out a way of finding it inventing it yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah no it's a it's a big thing I'm lots of people are contacting me about visas and having hoops they have to jump through in order to provide evidence for the visa process and it, mm. it's a, quite a difficult conversation sometimes when people are saying you know an agent is asking me for this and you know well I'm not an agent for a start so mm. you're already speaking to the right types of people but if, yeah. if that's what they're saying like that's, that's what Need. kind of what you need um, even for me as a teacher I remember having to go a little bit kind of cap in hand to previous employers kind of oh do you remember me like I need a statement yeah. of service yeah like, what's that and I'm like this is great so I'm going to frame the question in the sense of are you happy if I send you what I need you just mm. put it on a letter headed piece of paper and sign it at the bottom they're like yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. to do that <laughs> and being the type of person that always had to have a holiday booked 
then applying for a visa where you need the 10 year history of all the places you've traveled with the exact date, bear in mind. Yeah. I'm thinking, thank God for Facebook and yeah, thank God that I'm an well. over Sarah because if I didn't upload all of those photos of me in different countries, I never would have had a clue where I was on what date. With the timestamp as well, Mark yeah. Zuckerberg has inadvertently <laughs> helped mass migration across the world through that process. Thank God for him. <laughs> so when you finally got to the, the real world if you like and you had to start being an adult again what yeah. apart from the incredible bureaucracy what was your first impressions of, of being here it's weird because you dream of it and you go through so much to get here that when you're here you're kind of like oh my god I'm actually I'm actually here like and you look you do so much research and I think probably the best thing was just Going down to, I mean, I live in Brisbane, but being 45 minutes an hour away from the Gold Coast and like standing on those beaches like Burley and places like that, I'm just like, oh my God, this is actually mad. Like, how do I live somewhere where I can drive for an hour and just be somewhere like this? It, I think even after nearly two years, I still can't get my head around the fact that this is actually home. Do you know what I mean? But you had good beaches down in the southwest. Really? Breen? Is that a good one? No. Oh, I, don't know. I, don't... I, I, I no. lived in Reading. We had no beaches. But I know that when we ever wanted to go down, I mean, all right, not necessarily quite Somerset, but like Dorset and, yeah. and Devon. I know. And to be honest, we're not big beachy people either. Like my husband hates the beach. He hates the sand. Like I think it's just that kind of... I moved around in the UK. We moved around quite a lot with my husband being in the, in the Navy and my mum lived in London and he's from Manchester. So we moved around a lot. But moving somewhere very, even though they speak English here, it's still quite different. It's still quite a different place. And I kept asking people, this is what, probably the biggest thing when I first got here, was I'd be like, hey, like, they'd be like, how are you? I'm like, yeah, good. Are you okay? And they're like, yeah, I'm okay. Why Why shouldn't I be okay? And I'm like, I'm just, just asking if you're okay. Because... I didn't realise that saying, are you okay, they think that I think there's something wrong with them. I didn't realise it's how are you. And then when someone asks you how you are, they don't care how no. you are. It's just saying, how are you? So that was probably, yeah, I went off on a bit of a tangent there. But yeah, my, I don't know. My biggest one for that is, uh, I used to say, all right. All right. Just just that. Like, that's, that's the standard greeting, all right? And they're like, y yeah, I am. L like I've just diagnosed them with cancer or something. Like, hey, I'm just, I know. Just hello, mate. But I know. The, the, the reverse, it's the absolute reverse. When someone says to you, when you first get here, how are you? You're like, oh, well, I think about this now. Yeah. This is this is more than just a conversation about the weather. Yeah. You know, this is yeah. this is more than just a simple pleasantry. Yeah, Often thanks so much for showing an interest in how I'm feeling, you know? Like, brilliant. I'm actually great now you've asked, thanks. Sometimes now, because I know it, it literally means nothing. It's just a greeting. Yeah. People, I feel rude still when people go, oh, how are you? And I just go, yeah, and keep walking. <laughs> I do it because of my job. People will call and they'll be like, oh, um, hey, it's so-and-so from so-and-so. How are you? And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm really well. How are you? And they're like, yeah. Like, they didn't want me to answer ha how I am. They just, that's, it's 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 weird. But yeah. Just, just be I'm good. Getting, just be yeah. happy. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, that's enough. Always that enough. good. Yeah. So talking about then your job and yeah, your husband's job, one of yeah. the things that a lot of people have to weigh up when they move to Australia is how is that move going to impact on their career? Are mm. they moving for job prospects? Are they moving for quality of life? Are they perhaps moving for something a little bit of the, the two? How has the move affected yours or your husband's kind of careers and job progression and perhaps where you want to go in the future? Yeah, so my husband, so completely randomly, he now works for the same company that he worked for in the UK, but he didn't transfer or wasn't like recommended or anything. Just so happened a job popped up at the same company. And yeah, like he was like brilliant and he's gone in probably a little bit above what he was in the UK. So um, but obviously, as you know, the wages are so much better over here that, you know, it was it's UK. Was on, then. Yeah, there you go. In the UK, he was on a good wage, but he was a contractor. So that was kind of another issue for me is he would never take holiday. He'd very reluctantly take sick leave because, well, if I'm not working, I'm not getting paid. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, but we still need to spend time together as family. Whereas here, obviously, he's permanent. So he's on a good salary and then obviously gets the, the leave as well. For me, I think it was a... I I was a bit shocked in a negative way. So I have worked in the care sector for 10 to 12, about 12 years. 
it would be. Um, and I worked in a hospital setting for probably eight years. And I got here thinking I'd like to do the same sort of thing. I find the, the job very rewarding. It's not going to make me a millionaire, but I love, love the work. And they literally wouldn't even give me the time of day. No interview, no nothing, even, even with eight to 10 years experience, because I didn't have a piece of paper with a qualification on it. They didn't want to know. And I found that probably one of the most difficult things about Australia is nearly every single job you have to be qualified in it, even a barista. So you cannot apply for a job in a coffee shop unless you are a barista. They will not, they don't want to know, which led me down the path of medical nest. I knew that I wanted to have a job where I could make friends. I'm a very social person. So that was really important to me, building my social life and having that support network because I knew there would come a time where you know, I had a bit of a dip and was very homesick and I needed a reason to want to stay. So yeah, I got a job there and I absolutely love it. Like I couldn't have asked for a better job and a better team to walk into. I really have found like my best friends over here through my job. But yeah, I do feel a bit sad. I do miss the clinical side of my work and that patient contact um, for sure. Like, so it's difficult. I'm looking into doing a, a course and maybe going into kind of maybe disability care as well as what I'm doing now. But yeah, that's probably the biggest thing I would say to people is, you know, if you do a job like that, get your level three before you move over here, get your level three qualification, because if you come over here without it, there's going to be quite a few places that won't touch you, especially hospitals and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, Sam found the same kind of problems because we moved on my visa. All of my <laughs> qualifications and stuff were easily transferable. Uh, for her, she's done a lot of different jobs. She's uh, been a beauty therapist. Uh, she's got qualifications to do with that. Uh, she worked, before we left, she worked in a school as a uh, teacher's aide uh, and she had some qualifications to do with that. But working in a school setting here, they really do like you to, to have the full university qualifications. And then ironically, the um, qualifications that she had through that because she worked in a special educational school, they yeah. that qualified her to work in disability support, which even though she had UK qualifications, Australians still like you to have the Australian one rather yeah. than a foreign one. Uh, and the good thing is, and I guess this is perhaps a bit of something for you to think about, is here, although yes, you have to get the best piece of paper, there are lots of kind of government grants and funds Funding, yeah. particularly if it is something which is in demand like disability support work yeah. is so she managed to find the the cert three equivalents that they needed and kind of it was all work from home so she did it uh, in her own time probably with a bit of my help as well <laughs> uh, and i think it own it it cost definitely in the hundreds and i want to say it was less than like a hundred bucks it was yeah. literally like you're, you're pretty paying much free a bit just moment. so that they can take it seriously yeah yeah it's pretty much free at the moment like i've looked into it and um, if i wanted to do disability disability care cert three or whatever it is that they is over here i could do it completely for free the tafe course but if i want there's obviously lots of companies that do it that give you extra support mm. so i think i can do it for like 400 bucks um over a six month period and i get to go into class like once a week and get their support and stuff and to me that's that's worth that money anyway yeah. definitely something i'm going to look into and also i kind of feel like i'm approaching middle age and i just need to do something to remind myself that i've still got it my brain still works you know are you having a bit of a crisis yeah a little bit and it was either that or buy a porsche convertible and i can't afford one of them so i better do a course instead oh, well maybe with all the money that you're going to earn in disability support you'll yeah. be able to save up for one yeah. Tip both off. Now, if any of Jenny's story has inspired you to also want to make the move to Australia and you're not exactly sure where you could start on your journey moving over here, I mean, what visa do you even qualify for? Then you need to speak to the sponsors of our podcast, True Blue Migration Services. Speak to their team of Mara registered agents with decades of experience in helping people in some of the most complex of cases in securing a visa to live in Australia and live their best life. Follow the hundreds of positive Google reviews and like us, seek advice from the experts in going through what could be one of the most complicated moving processes you've ever experienced. And to help you out when you mention us, you can even try out their services for free, upload your resume or CV and use their free visa assessment service and see what options are open to you. 
And we can even go one stage further. And if you do decide, yeah, actually their service is pretty good. Because you've mentioned us, you'll even be able to save $200 off the cost of your visa. So when your visa finally does arrive, you can put it towards something nice to celebrate. Speak to them now on their website at www.truebluemigration.com. Now you said uh, social life, friends, family, all of that kind of thing was really, really important to you. Mm. How did you then go about building your new social life and your social circle in Australia after leaving everything behind? Yeah, so it's probably my biggest struggle even now, nearly two years on, is the friends that I miss in the UK, Um, especially when they're going through difficult times and stuff. I really struggle with that. But definitely having a job where I was in a team really helped because I could have gone into home care and I could have got a job doing that, but I knew I would be working on my own. So I didn't want to do that. I was also very fortunate that um, the agency that I've used does have like quite a big online community. Um, And we met another family who are like, they're our family over here. They've got two girls the same age as our girls. We do a lot of stuff together. We're spending Christmas together. Like they are our family. We've been on holiday and everything together. So that's really, really good. We know that we always have each other for support when we're feeling a certain way. We can always talk to each other and we know how we feel. They moved just like two weeks after us, I think it was. So we're very much on the same timeline. And I think it's so important. I'm a very social person. My husband, not quite so much but I knew that I had to do it you have to get out there and you have to put yourself out there and be vulnerable not everyone you meet is going to be your new best friend but to have lots of different people that you know and just to build up that kind of social network of people is so important even things like you know well if I if I meet this mum at the school she might know a trustworthy electrician so if I need to get my like something done in my house I'm not going to end up with some cowboy person you know it kind of is a knock-on effect so I've been really really fortunate I've made lovely friends over here and I wouldn't yeah I wouldn't change any of them at all been really really lucky I think that that's something as you get older that's very difficult to do is to meet new people especially with that whole well what if they don't like me what if they think this what who cares mate you need to have that mentality much like my five-year-old does we went on on a cruise over the holiday break and you know what kids are like when they meet other kids you know we're talking at dinner oh how was you how was kids club who who was that oh, and they just oh, I found a new friend blah blah they, they can describe everything that they've just done with them yeah and you say oh, what was their name I don't know yeah I don't know that's the best I and love don't care either like you know if I see them again great if I don't I don't you know yeah. by the end of it she's hugging everyone everyone seems to know her name I'm just sitting there looking like I know no one apart from these literally these people here and maybe the the woman that works on the kids club because I'm constantly dropping you off that's it how do you yeah. know everyone at the very beginning I was thinking to myself it's easy to make friends or acquaintances or meet new people if you've got children but actually yeah. it's not that necessarily the child that's the key it's the mentality of the child with regards to meeting new people just yeah. you're absolutely right throw yourself out there see what yeah. happens if you remember their name that's a bonus if not the next time you see them it's pretty awkward yeah, um just say like your do anyway just say oh, yeah there's old mate you know how are you yeah just don't say all right unless they're English. They won't understand anything. Have there been no. any moments then in your move living here that have made you question your decision at all? Gosh, yeah, probably quite a few. So the day before we were due to fly, dad's brother, his uncle, my uncle um, died um, quite yeah. suddenly. No, yeah, um, but he had dementia. He was quite old and everything. And my dad really struggled with that. He, My dad really struggled with us wanting to move anyway. Um, so that was kind of another difficult thing for him. And when we'd been here three weeks, my nan, his mum died. So it was not the best time for my dad. And also because we'd only been here three weeks, it was that, and I was really close with my nan and I'm really close with my dad. And it was kind of that, I can't, I can't go home. And she died on the 21st of December. So I was like, I either fly home and Christmas is, can I swear? Yeah. Really, really for my kids or that's not a bad swear word they say that all the time on the radio here yeah no okay i know my god i know i remember the first sorry just gotta go on to that subject quickly while we're there the first time i heard them swear on the radio i was like what i was thinking if that was england they'd have two hundred and fifty thousand offcom yeah. reports anyway back to my granny so yeah she really like sadly died but she was 95 and everything and i said to my dad look you know i can't come back and it that's really tough and I think I've had, you know, my best friend um, lost her dad to cancer. One of my other best friends uh, um, had a family member going through something really tough. And it's really hard. 
it's really, really hard when the people that you love are going through a really, really tough time in their life and you can't be there for them. Like, I'm a real, I really like to be that person that's there, you know, giving them a hug, you know, making them a brew and you can't do that. And that has been the hardest thing for me by far. And unfortunately, there has been some major life events in my friends' lives recently. And yeah, you just can't. It's easy to say when you're in the UK, oh, I'll just fly home when something happens. But that's not real life. You can't just drop your life and fly home every five minutes when something goes wrong. So I'd probably say that's the thing I've struggled with most since being over here really is is people that I would have always supported when I was in the UK. Uh, I can over the phone, but it's not the same. It's not the same. How do you cope with that? Oh, don't make me cry. I, I don't really. I don't very well. It's really hard. It's really hard. Yeah. When my friends, especially some really tough times my friends have been through recently and it's, it's you just don't know. You don't know what to say. And when you're physically with someone, you don't have to say anything. You can just be there. You can just sit together, have a cup of tea, hold their hand, give them a hug. But when you're the other side of the world, it's a bit awkward if you're on the phone and you don't speak. So you kind of, you know, have to say stuff. And it's just part of part of living far away. I don't really know how to answer that. Yeah, I don't cope with it very well. I'm a very emotional person. If you're my friend, I'll, you're my friend. Like I'll die for you and I'll do anything for you. And I invest a lot of my emotions into my friends and situations, which is my downfall a lot of the time because I get quite emotionally involved in situations. And yeah, it's a hard one, as you could probably tell, trying not to cry because I know that quite a few people watch your videos and I don't want my husband will tell me off if I'm crying on screen. It's okay. You'll be the first person to cry on the podcast, but no, it's okay. It's okay. It's, it's, I, no, it's, it's really refreshing to hear really, because I think sometimes people don't talk enough about the difficulties of living here. And mm. the biggest one, you're right, is friends and family. I We've had family members that we've lost since being yeah. here, especially when we didn't even have the choice to fly back because we lost some people during COVID when borders yeah. Yeah. and there was no chance that we could even have gone if we wanted to i think mm. living here sometimes you you have to you have the little box in your mind and you just learn to bury things yeah uh, yeah God knows how people cope. I, do you know what i think i know how people coped you know 50 years ago without the advent of technology sometimes we we're plagued because we have too much information and 100%. the fact that they didn't have the information and the content sometimes was probably one of the reasons why they didn't have to to really deal with it but yeah you if you don't have one of those little boxes at the back of your mind where you put all the horrible things that you don't want to think about you're gonna you're gonna need one yeah yeah and and it's so true you know like it's so true i'll never forget sitting in bed at god knows what time it was because my granny's funeral was like 2 p.m in the afternoon and having to watch my granny's funeral on my phone was something i really struggled with and then yeah my sister read out a poem for me and I, it sounds so weird, but I couldn't help but feel really jealous that I wasn't there. And like, I wasn't the one that was reading out that poem. Like, that's the poem I chose. I wanted to read that out. And I couldn't do that. And I was super close with my granny. And she had severe dementia. And um, she would only eat for me. And I, I hold a lot of guilt for leaving because I thought... But then she was 95 and she had enough of life anyway. She just had enough. She told me every time I saw her. Um, yeah, it, you're very right. Like, having a box is probably the best thing or maybe I need to go and see a counsellor. But... <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm all good. I'm all good. That, that's a way too, and I'm not saying... I mean, perhaps it's the male thing then. Ma yeah. Males have the box. You have the little yeah, box. We just don't, we don't want to talk about it. No, no. No, I'm I'm a talker, as you've probably guessed by now. Um, And I do, but I, I, I'm very open. I'll talk to my friends about how I'm feeling. I think that's important. And to unpack it. So you keep it in your box. I maybe keep my box for a week or so and I meet one of my friends and then I unpack my box and then I feel better because yeah like I think it is it, it's all very well people that emigrate and they post pictures of the beach and the the, the sky and you know, I'm, I'm guilty of that too I do it all the time but like you said people don't talk enough about the difficult things with emigrating and I do think if you have close connections in the UK or wherever you've originated it's not easy to leave that behind and their life carry on whilst you're not in it mm. so whether that's good or bad things you know going on to another difficulty then at the moment lots of people are talking about it all across the world but it seems like particularly in australia 
How have you found the financial realities of living here? Yes, we get paid more, but do you find that money goes further or are we better off? Do you know, this is an interesting one because I feel like people all the time, everything I see, it's, oh my God, it's the cost of living is so expensive in Australia. And I'm like, what? I don't agree. I think, I think we're so much better off here. Okay, Barry's wage is similar if you compare the fact that he was a contractor and now he's permanent. I'm on a much better salary than I was. Like, God, if I was doing this job in the UK, I'd be on about £9 an hour. Uh, you know, and I earn close to 40 It's absolutely ridiculous, the difference um, in, in the two places. You wouldn't get out of bed here for £9 an hour, would you? I literally said that to my friend the other day. I was like, I would not get out of bed for that amount anymore. Like, what on earth? Look at fuel prices, for example. Three at the moment, where I live in Richlands, 153. Like my local town, Yeovil, where I'm from, it's one pound twenty nine or something. And I'm like, how is it more expensive to live over here? I think the food shop is probably slightly more expensive, depending on how you eat, what you eat. Like, if you eat a lot of fresh produce, then I think it's probably about the same. But more like tins and all that kind of stuff um, is probably more. But I think... Isn't that a good thing if it kind of... Thought, who really wants to eat tins yeah. food? Like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But who doesn't want a tin of beans in their cupboard? You know, like everyone's got to have a tin of beans in their cupboard. I do, but my wife hates beans. Yeah. That's probably one of her main downfalls. <laughs> really? I mean, but you've got a tin of beans. Yeah, no, she hates beans. Any yeah. beans or uh, chickpeas, anything like that. She oh, yeah, chickpeas like are texture. gross. Chickpeas are gross. They're basically yeah. the same, just not in tomato no. sauce. No, we'll have to agree to disagree on that one. I like the beans, though. Is there anything that you found then particularly expensive? There's got to be something that you think, why is that so much? Houses? Yeah. Oh, my God. When we first started looking at property, like when we first started the process, we could have got what we've got now for like half the price. It's absolutely mm. mad. I mean, you'll know, especially in Brisbane, um, it's crazy, the house prices. We We bought straight away when we got here. And it was a reno project and we sold it for so much more in like 18 months. But then it's all relative, right? Because the house that we've now bought is probably 300 grand more than what we would have paid two years ago. So I'd probably say rent. I mean, we don't rent, we, we own, but buying and renting property is crazy. Like some of my friends been like looking for one or two bed apartments in the city. And it's like, I, I mean, I wouldn't be paid to live in some of the places that are asking for like $700 a week in rent. You know, it's mad. I, I think sometimes perhaps it's, it comes down to where you lived in mm. wherever you're from. I mean, we yeah. lived just outside of London. Yeah. And I know that you know, yeah, you're right. Brisbane prices are going crazy. The second most expensive city in, in Australia, and it doesn't seem to be getting, I don't think it probably go ever higher than Sydney, but mm. it's, it's not seeming to relent at the moment. But I mean, I still check the house that we sold in the UK, like what mm. its value is in, in comparison. And, and that's still, still rising. So mm. that's one of the major reasons why we decided to move from the UK is because we wanted, you know, I looked at our house and you know, it was good enough, but mm. I, I just kind of thought, is this it? Is this the best that I'm ever going to be able to, to have? Um, you know, extending it is a, still a kind of the only real dream. Mm. Um, but those prices are kind of still going up. And I think if we probably would still be in the same house if we hadn't moved. And I think you pay all of that money for that. You know, yeah. 84 square meters it was. The average Australian house is something like just shy of 200. It's like yeah, so, I know. Yeah, when you think, okay, the price of things is is so much more, you're getting more for it. That's yeah, and, I, space anyway. and I've gone from living in a small country town to a city, a major city. That's obviously, you know, I don't really ever take that into a, into consideration. So the house that we had in the UK was was a big house and we sold it for a good price. Um, but yeah, just the comparable of what we could buy in Brisbane and we live on the outskirts too. We're not Bayside or anything. And I was like horrified. I can't lie. I was like, oh God, this is what we can get for what we, not to sound too snobbish. But yeah, um, but we've got a lovely house now and stuff. So it's just, I think it all depends on what you enjoy doing as well. Like, you know, the question with like, what do you find expensive? Well, we don't do a lot. We're geeks. Like, we don't really go out drinking. We very rarely get takeaways. Our secret passion is Lego. So we spend, like, all of our money on Lego. Yeah, so that's that's the same price in the UK as it is here. So. Well, yeah. that's one good thing then. Yeah. 
Exactly. Now you've got more space to, to put the Lego, Lego out. I think sometimes when people have a hobby where they like to collect things, you end up kind of being like a semi hoarder because you, yeah. you have nowhere to kind of display it or put it. And if, hey, if that's what you want to collect, you want to be able to see it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. And it's good. Like we've got, um, we've got a room downstairs, which is like going to be a movie room, but it's also going to be like the Lego room too. So yeah, nice time. The Australian people's houses that I've ever been to, they always, I don't want to say like collect weird like <laughs> like I'm weird. You know, there's but always something you go, yeah. I, I wouldn't have put you as collecting one of those. Yeah. You, you've got space to be able to do it. Yeah. Yeah. My, my one probably seems to be, I just seem to collect hobbies. So, you know, whenever there's like a, I don't want to say a new fad, but I think to myself, you know, I've got tennis rackets, I've got golf clubs. I've actually got three sets of golf clubs. So I don't need all three. Like I just collect all the stuff. And yeah. it's like, well, what am I going to freaking do with it? My garage. All the gear, no idea. All right. Little bit of idea. Okay. <laughs> Each, for each one, a little bit for each one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jack of all trades, master of none. Yeah. What has been the biggest surprise then for you and your family living here? Probably just how much more positive you feel because of the weather. Um, and yeah, like everyone I feel is quite friendly. Everyone asks how I am every day. So yeah, I don't know. The weather, the welcoming, also the schoolings. So the schooling system I prefer over here. I love the fact that you've got that wraparound care, which is so much better than the UK, like OSH, that's what they call it with us. I don't know if that's the same with you guys. Like before and after school care, which then gives the parents more opportunity to be able to work and do what they what you want to do without being constricted because of like having to do school runs and stuff. And how much the government like fund that as well. Mm. We're on good wages and they pay 62% of our OSH fees. So yeah, I think that was a really pleasant surprise. Um, and just, just, I don't feel like I have to go on holiday. I've got, we're lucky. We've got a really nice house. We've got a pool. We're an hour away from the local beach. You know, Brisbane city has got so much to offer. You've got South Bank, you know, you've got all the lovely like bars and restaurants and all of that stuff to do and all the free parks, like Kedron Park is a joke. Like, can you imagine how much it would cost? There would be like six foot fences around that kind of thing in the UK with like bouncers at the door and it'd be like 25 pound entry for two hours play. Like that's all for free. And I don't think, yeah, that's something that will never stop amazing me is what is on offer completely free of charge splash parks you know like water even just like being able to fill your water up for free and not being scammed into having to go into a shop and pay two dollars fifty for a bottle of water so yeah i think that's probably the been the biggest shock that i wasn't expecting is the additional help and free things that we are offered by being here yeah, no, I, uh, one thing that uh, just adding to that is also the fact that very rarely do people seem to want to wreck stuff like yeah. the usual kind of graffiti things you, you see, uh, yeah. I think less so of the, just, I want to tag something for the sake of tagging stuff. Sometimes you think, well, oh, okay, it doesn't actually look too bad, uh, but like that, that's the worst. Very, yeah. very rarely do you see fly tipping, you know, yeah. very rarely, well, perhaps a little bit more rarely, you might see a bit of litter dog it every now and again, but like, yeah, that's hardly at all. Yeah. It like, hardly seems at to all. be relentless with how anything nice in england it just seemed like someone really wanted to just ruin it yeah um, like a kid's park in england a kid's park would have a penis drawn on it somewhere there would be a penis somewhere on that car on that park yeah i know but that's what i mean like you you don't see that here i don't take my kids to the park and have to check for what words might be on there or what graphic drawings are on there you know you must have lived in a nice area then because when i when we left so in the few months before we left uh, the kids the local kids decided they wanted to set fire to the the benches and the and the seating so the council took those away you know if you can't keep it then you're not allowed anywhere to sit people used to break glass and put it at the bottom yeah. of the slide and things like that um i always remember i'll never forget this i was in hotel quarantine and still on the you know facebook maybe mm. pages or whatever you call it mm. and the, the one that this is the one that made me decide, do you know what? I can leave this now because I don't live there anymore. Yeah. Someone was warning people, don't let your kids go down the slide, not because of glass, but because someone had decided to take a shit down it. Oh my God. And I was like, thank God I don't live there anymore. Is... <laughs> so like, what goes through someone's mind? I don't even want to get into this because my mind is just running wild right now. Like, I can't even deal. What is wrong with people? Mm. What on earth? Honestly. Some people, people are, are, yeah, built differently, I guess. Yeah. It sounds like you've had a lot of new experiences living in Australia. 
mm-hmm. positive experiences. Mm-hmm. Have there been any things, any experiences in particular that think have changed you as a person? Having to deal with huntsmen spiders, probably the biggest change. No, like I don't want anyone to see this and be like, oh no, there really is loads of things that want to kill you. Like huntsmen are actually your friend. You kind of want a huntsman in your house because they kill everything else that's gross that lives, that wants to come into your house. But I've had to man up. I've had to man up with the whole spider situation. I've not once seen a snake and I was here for your story when you had that snake by your pool, by the way, because I was like, oh my God, I'm so glad it's not just me that's lived in Australia for all this time and has never seen a snake. I'm desperate to have one now in my garden. Preferably not a brown one. Yeah, not a brown. No. No one ever wants one of them. No, I think that it's taught me to be braver in lots of different ways with huntsman spiders, being braver with just getting out there and trying new things and meeting new people. As I said, I've always been quite a confident person. I've always been that person that would talk to anybody. But it's just coming here and not knowing anyone or anything. It's taught me to be like, right, come on, you just need to get on with it and do it. But other than that, I think I'm just a better version. That sounds so cheesy. God, I feel sick. But yeah, I'm a better version of myself now. Yeah, I just think I am. I think I'm a I'm a happy person all year round rather than just the three months where we saw the sun in the UK. Like. I just feel I'm just a happier person, which makes me a better mum and it makes me just, yeah, happier person. I'm not moaning all the time. Well, my husband would disagree, but yeah. Are there any things that you miss? What do you miss the most? Other than friends and family, we, we've already talked about that. Like, what weird things do you miss? Milky Ways. I really miss Milky Ways. Like, what is that brown stuff they put in, in, in them over here? Have you had a Milky Way over here? No, not really. I'm not really a chocolate kind of person. Well, I'm not here for sweets or lollies or whatever you want to call them. I love chocolate and I am not okay with how they make the Milky Ways here. So that's a big problem for me. I miss the Milky Ways and whenever anyone comes over, they have to bring Milky Ways with them in order to be let in the spare room. What else do I miss? I miss the oldness. I miss like, I miss, so I didn't actually live in Yeovil. I lived in a small village called, uh, well, it's a town called Somerton. And it's just old. Like our house was a hundred years old. Like I just miss looking at a building and thinking, oh, that's really old and cool. Like my house is nearly older than Australia, you know, like I just find that weird that in Australia, everything is quite new. But yeah, mainly just Milky Ways, to be fair. That's probably the only thing. Have you found anything like as a, as a not necessarily a substitute for Milky Ways? It sounds like there could never be a substitute for Milky Absolutely Ways. Never. But have you found anything that you, that you can't get in the UK that you think, oh, I really love these now? No. No? There's nothing? No. Nah. I, I really miss like Skips. I think the the crisp, like crisps or chips or whatever. Honestly, I'm like a snack of both. Um, I really miss like all those those little treasures. But that's where you have to be careful, right? Because if you always are hung up on those things, you're never gonna feel like this is home. So we order in wheat bix because I can't deal with wheat bix. So we get wheat bix. No, it's not. Nah. And yeah, I just get my little fix. Like my friends will send me, like my kids, my kids love Percy Pigs from S and stuff. But there's nothing that I think, oh yeah, I really love that more than Milky Ways. No. There's there's plenty of uh, British shops and yeah. you know, online British shops where you can get things ordered in if you really, really need to. Or yeah, every, every now and again when people come to visit you, um, that's their entry fee. You know, yeah. You've got to put those kind of things. For my mum, even though she, she lives in the Philippines, even when she comes, she knows she has to bring her 2.25 liters of alcohol just because that's so bloody expensive like yeah what do you want me to bring anything mum i'll drink yeah. it you know, just... as long as it's not drain fluid and it's yeah. not gonna make me go blind like, that'll do. Yeah. it's it's true like i i almost in a weird way i almost love that i can't just get it whenever i want because then when someone does bring it it's a real special treat you know like i still prefer penguins to what they called what are they called? That's an Australian. I know, and I'm not sure I'll get my citizenship if if this goes if this that's goes one out. Of the questions. That's one of the questions on it. What what? How do you do a Tim Tam slam? Tim Tam, that's the one. Now I'm not. I don't like it. Everyone else in the house loves them, but I'm. I'd still pick a penguin over a Tim Tam any day. You just love the shit joke that's on it, don't you? Absolutely, it's the best part. 
the excitement of like peeling it over and seeing if it's worth it or not. Yeah, I think one of the other bad things about wanting your your English fix or, or getting things that you can't necessarily get. I was in Coles today and I was looking through, uh, you know, up and down the aisles, and I saw the the English, the United Kingdom section. Tiny it's terrible. <laughs> if that's what Coles and, and it's the same in Coles or Woolies, they're the same stuff. Polos. If that's what you think we love. No we wonder the stuff's always, you know, on special because it's about to go out of date. Yeah. Barry's tea is good. Barry's tea bags are good. And my, my husband is called Barry. So when we saw them, we were like, right, we're going to get Barry's tea because Barry loves the brew. Isn't that like an Irish thing, Barry's tea? Oh, maybe. I don't know, but we never drank them before, but now we drink Barry's tea. We don't drink like PG or anything because the tea bags are terrible over here. They're so like... Um, Lipton's. Yeah. Yeah. They're just not, it's not great, is it? Someone like made even... me a cup of Lipton's, like they got it out, like thinking, but it's English breakfast tea. And I was like, but it's Lipton's. It's, it's absolutely not. Know. Yeah, there's nothing English about this. Yeah. I even saw, uh, and this wasn't even in the UK section, it was just in the normal tea section. They were selling Yorkshire tea. And I was like, that'll do. Yeah. Yeah, that'll do. Yeah. 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 yeah, I feel like it's no in between. It's either like, this is going to keep you awake for 48 hours, or this is basically just hot water with a hint of maybe a grain of tea or whatever it is the australians are a lot more american than they they want to let out that's what i found don't they let have, them know that we they, they they know they know but they just they they put it in their little box what are the big plans for the future for jenny and barry and the kids to try and get them to stop saying things like skibbity toilet and god knows riz and all this uh, what even is that i don't even know what that oh, is they've crazy. learned some They've learned some lingo since we moved here, but um, big plans. I mean, we don't really have any big plans. We want to get a jet ski. Our friends have got a jet ski. They live on the waterway and yeah, it's always really fun. So we want to get a jet ski. But yeah, it's just to... You have to get your license if you want a jet ski. I know, but they've both done theirs so we can like, you know, get some insider tips. It's not hard. It's just, you just go out on, on a course and... Yeah. They probably just go, yeah, I see that thing. Can you make it move and not die? Yeah, I will sign you off. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, we don't really have any big plans. Like, oh, there's lots of places we want to see. We went to Melbourne. Cold. Very cold. Went there, not last weekend, the weekend before. I want to do... Here's one question then. You did the whole... You said you had a motorhome in the UK. You went round Europe in your motorhome. I had a guest last week that they're currently doing their big lap. Is I that saw... something that you'd ever want to do? Oh, God. Yeah, for sure. Would love to. Would love to but probably when the girls have left school and probably without the girls maybe just me and Baza I would absolutely love to and we genuinely considered it when we first got here but my mum also moved with us so she's on a student visa she's 62 she's an absolute legend she's doing a psychology degree because the only way that she could stay in Australia for a long period of time because of her age and everything was to get a student visa so she was like oh yeah sod it I'll do it and she's put everything in it. She's like in the program of excellence, top 1% of the uni. So I was kind of like, my mum's done this so that she can be here and be a part of our life and help us with the kids and stuff. If we then told her what we were going to pack up and yeah. F off in a motorhome around Australia for a year, I think she might kill us. So yeah, I would 100% do it when the kids are older. Just me and Baza, yeah, for sure. How long has she got left on her degree? Only till August next year. And so do when it's finished? We're not really sure. We're going to just take uh, each step at a time. She, my mum is honestly, she's an absolute legend. She has done the clip around the world yacht race. She, yeah, so part of that was the Sydney Hobart race. My mum is like, yeah, she just does whatever she wants to do. She'll put her mind to it and she does it. So she's going to go and do some traveling around Canada. And then she wants to use her degree because she's retired. She wants to use her counseling degree to volunteer in maybe some like um, countries where they, they need that for some charities and things like that. Um, yeah, she's just a legend. She would just be floating like out. She should do what I think most people's parents should do. You know, retire as quickly as you can. Don't worry about us to your kids anymore because we, we're building a better life for ourselves. Retire as quickly as you can, get as financially stable as you can so that you can do that thing where you kind of, you know, go to the UK for those three months when it's nice and then yeah. come and visit us when it's cold and dreary and we can yeah. have a bit of sunshine. And that's basically what she's going to do for a couple of years because until she gets the age of the age of parent visa, she's just going to flit around. She's just going to use her degree life. to help people live her best life. Exactly. Because look you know sounds cheesy but you only get one and you might as well do whatever you want when you want to do it especially if you can afford it why not absolutely so, yeah is there anything that would make you go back so 
I talked this through with Barry and it's a very difficult question because I feel like my go-to answer would be, well, if something happened to a family member or if something happened like that, I'd go back. In reality now, I've built such a life here that my heart will always be in two places. So if I like left my whole life here to go back, so yeah, probably not. I don't think I don't think I could and I know it sounds so like bad but I don't think I could ever live in that climate again. I don't think I could wake up every day to that weather again like I just don't enjoy it like and I just think been given this opportunity over here why would I do that? It's all and the it's, little things isn't it that yeah. they add up to make the big thing. Yeah, the big yeah. thing for the UK or, or home if you like is the friends and the family. They're mm. they're a big thing but it's, yeah. it's everything else that's I know. And it sounds selfish when I say, or like, I'd never want to move back there. It sounds like I don't care about the people that I've left behind, but that couldn't be further away from the truth. Like, as I've obviously expressed during this chat, like, it's the hardest thing. I struggle with it every day with missing people and everything. But my life is so good here. Like, I'm so lucky. And I just feel like it's very easy when you're feeling homesick to think that you miss the place, but it's not. You miss those people. So you, read a lot about ping pong poms or whatever that aren't happy here. So they go back over and then they can't settle there. So they come back. And I think really it's because when you've lived somewhere that is away from home, your your life and your heart is never just in one place anymore. Like it's always in different places. And that's hard because you can't ever feel 100% complete in one place because you've almost got a home in diff- in more than one place. So I think that's one of the reasons why I personally have found it easier than Sam, my wife, because, you know, she's o- only ever really lived in the UK. I've mostly lived in the UK, but having uh, uh, a Filipino mum and going and visiting there a lot, I- I've always felt a little bit like a-, a third culture kid anyway. Never Filipino enough to be fully Filipino and never really English enough to be fully English. I'm just kind mm. of a bit of both. And then I guess now, living in australia for four years can you even have a fourth culture kid like you know yeah but I, i've come to terms with that fact that i'm never really going to be any of the three different things where i've lived but i'm just gonna be the best part of all of them and, and yeah. yeah that's the selfish part of it not yeah. for me very few people can actually live the experiences that i've kind of lived so yeah why should i hold myself to account for someone else who doesn't really have the same situation as me yeah no definitely i couldn't agree more have you made is there any mistakes that you've made in this whole process that you wish you hadn't buying a jeep was a terrible mistake they say um the brand jeep yeah yeah an old one and everyone i say i'm like oh i bought a dodgy car and everyone's like oh what is it and i'm like a jeep and they're like oh shouldn't have done that what happened why was it a bad don't get me started i basically bought from a cowboy dealership and it all just went wrong from there bless her jesse the jeep i shouldn't bow mouth her she sat down on me driving she's been doing me well for the last few months touch wood but yeah i'd say maybe do your research with the car situation you think you're doing the right thing going to a dealer but in reality sometimes they're just as bad as private sales making mistakes i know i'm absolutely perfect i've done it all 100 percent right like what can i say yeah i don't think there really is anything to be honest in that case what advice then would you have for someone looking to make the move as well then i would say don't try and like if you've got an area you want to move to great like we knew we wanted to move to brisbane but don't try and do research on the suburbs like before you get here because you need to get a feel for the suburb to know whether you like it. And just because you read things on the internet, 99 times out of 10, 99 times out of 100, people will post negative things. There's always negative things on, like you, like we were saying, on all the community pages and stuff. And there was negative things posted about our suburb and it's absolutely bloody lovely. I love it. And so I'd say spend, like try and allocate some time when you first arrive so you don't have to start work straight away. You can just get your ducks in a row. It really explore the area that you want to live and make sure you get it right. Um, it was something that was really important for me was making sure we got the suburb right because I knew that once I'd enrolled our girls into school, I didn't want to have to move them again. And I wanted to make sure that they... I'd taken them away from their friends once. I didn't want to have to do it again because we didn't like where we lived. That was important for me. So we were really lucky that we, I feel we got it right first time with our suburb. Yeah, but but it's not for everyone. You know, a lot of people want to live Bayside and things like that. So really write down what's important for you. And then when you get here, spend some time in those areas, you know, go to the coffee shops, go and sit in the park, maybe 
like in the early evening just make sure there's not things going on that you wouldn't want to live near basically no great advice you've you've been one of our probably most balanced helpful people jenny cool thank you thank you for that I I mean, if there's, if there, is there one last piece of wisdom then that you can leave our listeners with if you're even watching this podcast you're obviously thinking about making the move just do it like just do it because you won't regret it and if you do you can just go home like it's not nothing in life is forever and i it was the best decision we ever made was coming here and i would just say just go for it explore your options go for it and yeah you'll be living your best life in no time or you can be on a student visa at 62 absolutely the legend that is sue yeah absolutely she can give anyone any tips let me know thanks jenny for speaking with us and i hope it's giving you all a greater insight in what it takes to move to australia even if you are a social butterfly if you want to see more of what our life is like in australia then you can check us out on YouTube and Instagram at That Johnston Life. And if you've been inspired to make the move yourself, then make sure to speak to the sponsors of this podcast, True Blue Migration Services. Remember, when you mention us, you can try them out for free and use their free visa eligibility assessments and see exactly what visas are available for you. And when you finally realize that their service is probably second to none, by mentioning us, you've also saved an additional $200 off the cost of your visa. Fill in their free visa eligibility assessment today at www.truebluemigration.com. And I'll see you next time.